And as Jim just mentioned, uh, Daron and I will do a sort of a tag team. So we'll, I'll do the first lecture, Daron will do the second, I'll do the third, and he'll do the fourth. So we'll have breaks in between. And just in terms of background, so the slides from the two parts I'll do are available here on my website. Um, and Daron will tell you about this, I guess, some paper copies of Daron's slides and also PDF is, of his. So the um, assumption here will be that people are not necessarily familiar with network analysis. Some of you I know uh, from seeing faces are, but some people aren't. And so we'll, we'll start from sort of ground zero in terms of, of building up. And the first lecture here is going to be just a, a sort of a crash course, basic background of, of analysis of social networks. Um, some measures that might be useful, how we think about representing networks and so forth, and then we'll get progressively in a little bit deeper as we go into the other lectures. It's, a, it's an enormous area that covers lots of literatures now, so we'll, we'll be a little bit um, pressed for time in terms of, of digging deep. But do stop me if, you, if there's something that you need clarified. Um, I, I'm happy to clarify things as we go along. And, and so one just basic starting point, uh, why study networks? basically because a lot of our economic interactions are in, within social structures. Um, the way that we form opinions, uh, how we uh, learn about things, um, people influence our behaviors, access to job information. There's a, a long list here, transmission of viruses, um, uh, favor exchange, choices of behavior. The, the list is very extensive. And understanding how network structure impacts these behaviors can be first order in a lot of applications. And so understanding um, the connection is, is fairly critical. You can also be purely interested in, in social structures. So when you talk to sociologists, they're not necessarily always interested in what the implications are, but sometimes just you know, prima facie interested in, in what that networks look like. Um, but we'll, we'll move a little bit beyond that in these lectures. So um, there's lots of literatures that work on or around these topics. And you'll be seeing snippets of, from different ones as we go along. So um, sociology is obviously the, the one that's been at it for more than a century. Economics, a couple of decades. Computer science, a decade or so. Statistical physics, actually, is probably one of the most active areas in this research these days. Um, random graph theory. There'll be a bunch of different tools we'll pull from. And we'll look at a little bit of, of what the state of the art is from an economist perspective. Um, and we'll also be talking about areas of open research as we go along. Okay, so four parts. I'll be doing the first and the third, their own, the, the second and the fourth. And the first one's just going to be very basic, some measures. How do we operationalize networks in ways that are, are useful? Um, then Daron's going to talk a little bit about peer effects and identification issues. Um, then I'll come back into talking about diffusion and more on identification issues and some estimation problems and challenges in, in working with networks. And then uh, Daron will wrap things up by talking more generally about how we can understand transmission of shocks and other kinds of things um, through economies using networks as a, as a tool. OK. So what I'm going to start with is just a few examples pulled from different uh, research areas of, of different kinds of data and, and a view of a few applications and just preview some of the the, the kinds of questions, just so people are aware of the kinds of things we're talking about. And here, um, I always start with my favorite example, which comes from uh, work by Paget and Ansel, and goes back to um, work that had been done by Kent earlier, which is looking at the, uh, this is a, a network of marriages in um, Florentine, uh, in Florence in the 15th century. And um, you can see here's a, a, a See if I have a pointer. Um, sure, this is turned on. Yes, but the pointer doesn't seem to work. Um, there we go. Okay, so so at the center here are the Medici, and part of this is is trying to understand how the Medici rose from being an, a not so prominent or uh, moderately important family to being one of the more important families during the, this time period. And uh, I'll, I'll we'll come back to this story a little bit later, but the marriages uh, play an important role. Um, another example here um, is one uh, which comes from the Ed Health data set. This is a set of students in a high school in the US, um, color coded by gender, male and female, male blue, uh, female or pink in this picture. And um, uh, a link between two indicates that they had a romantic relationship inside uh, an 18 month window during which this, these data were collected. 
Um, so you begin to see things that actually are, are quite typical of, of networks. Uh, there's one large component where a lot of the students are interconnected. Um, and then a bunch of smaller connected uh, components. And these numbers down here, there were actually 63 um, dyads where there were just two people interacting. But then there's a lot of, of, of individuals who are connected, um, interconnected through a larger component. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that and some of the implications of this for things like diffusion as we go along. Um, this is a, a picture of military alliances in, in the year 2000. This is from uh, a uh, paper I'm working on with a uh, student at Stanford. And it turns out that these networks actually correlate very strongly with trade alliances. And understanding the, the interaction between the uh, military alliances and the trade alliances gives us uh, a, a picture into the incidence of war. It, it gives us insights that we wouldn't have otherwise. And you can begin to see that there's a lot of, of military alliances which are geographically based, which actually correlate uh, heavily with trade networks. And you can look at the evolution of these kinds of networks over time and try to understand what the implications of these things are for both trade and for military interventions in war. Um, this is uh, um, one from uh, a paper by Soromaki and, and some co-authors, which looks at interbank uh, loans overnight. Um, so here we have basically the four largest banks you can see here, J.P. Morgan Chase, um, Bank of America, uh, Citigroup and Wells Fargo. Um, there's a, something which is typical of some networks, but not others. Here, this is what's known as a core periphery network, where you see about 25 banks which are completely connected. So they all interact with each other. And then a bunch of smaller banks which in, tend to interact with just one or two of the, of, of the others. And so in that case, um, you end up with a very particular pattern for, for contagions and other kinds of things, as, as we'll see in, in the last lecture. So networks are going to have different shapes. They come in all sorts of different applications. And these are just previewing some of the types of things we'll be looking at. Um, but the main challenge with dealing with network data is that the number of networks that you might observe on any given set of nodes is exponentially large. And just to, to sort of drive that point home, here if you just had uh, 20 nodes, if you start thinking about counting the number of networks which are possible, well, you know, you just go through the combinations here. Person one could have 19 possible friends. Person two, 18, not counting person one, and so forth. You end up with um, two to the 190th possible networks um, just on 20 nodes. And so, um, you know, given that the, if you, if you go to Wikipedia, this is a Wikipedia number here, um, the number of atoms in the universe is somewhere between two to the 158th and two to the 246th by people's estimates. Uh, you've got more networks just on 20 nodes than you have um, atoms in the universe. So, so you're looking at something which is a fairly large number of networks, and that means it's impossible just for us to describe particular networks and categorize them just directly by saying, okay, it's, you know, it's network number 75. Um, that's not going to be very meaningful. So we're going to have to simplify things somehow. And in particular, uh, in terms of simplification, what we're going to do is is have to work with statistics or aggregate descriptions of networks in ways that are still useful but capture important description, descriptive details of the networks and allow us to tie them back to economic behaviors and things that have implications for economic behaviors. So the question is sort of, what are the objects? How do we describe these objects in ways that are, are simple enough to work with and don't in involve so many different calculations, but at the same time, uh, are, are useful in terms of driving implications. So what we're going to do is, in, in the first lecture, is we'll, we'll go through four different types of, of characterizations. The first is going to be global patterns of networks. So we'll talk about things on sort of a global level, things like path lengths in networks. So how far does it take to get from an average node to another node in a network? Um, degree distributions. So how connected are different, uh, different nodes in a network? Is it a very regular network? Does everybody have exactly the same number of connections? <laughs> Does it look more like a core periphery sort of network? So these are going to be things that describe the network as a whole and look at these sort of global patterns. And then we'll drill into um, segregation patterns. So these are kinds of things that we can look at where the, the, node, the, the network has no labels on it. It's just a, a picture of a, of a network. We don't know what the characteristics of it is, and we just know that there's some patterns that are emerging. We can also begin to, to start labeling nodes by their types. 
And once we start doing that, then there's a separate set of patterns that will emerge, and in particular what we'll call homophily, uh, which is the tendency of, of similar nodes to be associated with each other. So there's strong segregation patterns in, in networks, and these are going to be another sort of global characteristic that are going to be important to take care of. So we'll have these, these larger sort of macro kinds of descriptions of networks, and then we'll be looking at a more micro level, so we can begin to look at local patterns. So uh, if I'm connected to two friends, are they friends with each other? That's what's known as clustering. That has important implications in things like risk sharing, favor exchange, um, information passing in a network. So we'll talk about sort of local patterns. How do things look on a very local level? Um, we'll also talk uh, at the end of this first lecture about positions in networks. So another thing which turns out to be important is being able to characterize who is important in a network, who's influential, who's powerful, who's central. So there's a whole series of different ways of measuring things like centrality, um, influence, power, these kinds of terms that you, you have some idea of what they mean. We can operationalize those by looking at a network and saying, this is the most important node in a very specific sense. So we'll be able to rank nodes based on some sort of measures of importance. Okay, so, so these will be things that look more at, at a particular characteristics, either of a local neighborhood or particular nodes, and these other ones will be broad, overarching kinds of pictures of the network. Okay, so let's start with the first ones. We'll talk a little bit about path lengths and, and degree distributions. So what do we know a little bit about these things? And um, before doing that, let me just give you a little bit of, of uh, notation to, to fix ideas. So. Generally, we're going to be talking about some finite set of nodes, vertices, players, agents, whatever you might uh, call them, depending on the particular application. So one through n. And the types of uh, the relationships on these, the network is often going to be represented by what we call the adjacency matrix, which is just a matrix of, in, in this case, say, zeros and ones. So either people are friends with each other or they're not. Um, they're allies or they're not allies. They're trade partners or they're not trade partners. Uh, they had a romantic relationship or they didn't. So these are just zero, one relationships. And we'll, we'll uh, keep track of this just via a matrix known as the adjacency matrix. Okay? Now, um, sometimes we're going to be interested in uh, particular weighted versions of this. We can also allow the you know, intensities of these relationships. They, they might be directed. I, I might be paying, I might cite somebody that doesn't cite me back. Um, so depending on the particular application, these might have different, uh, different uh, weights or directions. The canonical version is just going to be zeros and ones in situations where things tend to be reciprocal. So if I'm friends with you, you're friends with me. Okay. So uh, in a network then, often when we talk about paths, We'll represent these things graphically. We can talk about a path from 1 to 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. This is a, a particular path in this network. We can also talk about shortest paths. Um, 1, 3, 7 would be the geodesic in this, a, a shortest path in the network. And so often we'll be interested in shortest paths for things like information transmission. How long does it take for a piece of information that's injected in one part of the network to reach everyone else? Does information transmit quickly or slowly in a network? We might be interested in then what's the average path length. And path length here will often work with shortest paths, not uh, necessarily longest paths. OK. So um, the diameter of, of a network is the largest geodesic. So you look at the, the, the longest distance between any two nodes where distance is measured by shortest paths. So that would be known as the diameter. In lots of situations, uh, a network might have some isolated nodes or some disconnected small components. In that case, what's often used when people talk about the diameter of a network, they'll be talking about the largest component. So for instance, even if you look at Facebook, you, know, you have 700 million nodes, you'll have situations where there's some people who just have web pages and, and absolutely no friends. Um, you don't want to say that the, the distances are infinite just because you have a few disconnected nodes. You measure things on the rest of the, the large component of the network. Okay. Um, diameter can be prone to outliers. So often we'll talk about average path length instead. So you can look at the average distance between nodes as opposed to the maximum distance between nodes. Um, and these things, again, are going to be important because they help us understand how quickly information is going to diffuse um, through a network or, or how fast a contagion might occur. 
um, and how, th how long it might take for things to move from one place to another. Okay. So one feature that has been known for quite a while now, uh, I guess Milgram is probably the first really nice uh, illustration of this, is that, that social networks, when you look at acquaintances and, and different relationships between people, tend to have short average path lengths. And in particular, um, let me describe what Milgram did. If people don't know this, Milgram was famous for various experiments, but one of his famous experiments was a letter experiment where he gave letters to people in one part of the US and asked them to send those letters to targets in the other part of the US. So you were given a name, say, um, John Smith is an economist in Massachusetts. Um, see if you can get this letter to them. It starts out in Nebraska or Kansas. Um, the person then sends it to, to one of their friends. And the letter then has a list. And you can put the, the second person then puts their name on the list and then forwards it to a third person that they might think is somehow able to get this letter on. So if, maybe if I'm in Kansas, I, I don't know John Smith. I don't know any economist. Maybe I send it to a friend I know who lives in Boston. And then that friend happens to know somebody um, at a university, so sends it to that person and so forth. And, and through that method, then it eventually makes its way, hopefully, to the target. And so out of this experiment, basically what he found was that the 25% of the letters made it, um, which is actually a high number given participation rates. And now you multiply those participation rates, so you get a fall off. And the median was five. So the median number of hops was five. So it, 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 the distance was, was fairly short compared to what you might expect. And also notice that this isn't necessarily the shortest path in the network, right? So this is a path in the network, but it could be that since people don't know exactly what the shortest path is, they don't see the network, they sent it in a very circuitous route. Now, there's some serious problems with uh, taking this number as a median. Why? Um, there's a selection bias here. So more distant chains are less, less likely to make it than shorter chains. And so you're biased in ways that, that are going to favor lower numbers uh, of being successful. So you, you, there is some, some uh, endogeneity to the ones that made it. And there are subsequent follow-up experiments that have taken care of that, that, that try and estimate exactly what the unbiased uh, estimate of, of these kinds of hops are. You can also just look at these things directly. Um, these are looking at co-authorship studies. Um, so in economics, there's a study by uh, Sanjeev Goyal um, and uh, uh, Vanderle, Marco Venderle and, and Morago Gonzalez. Um, you know, you get about uh, economics, the mean is about 9.5 and the max is 29. If you just put all economists who publish in a decade, um, published in an ISI indexed journal, tie, put a tie between them if they co-authored a paper, and then just look at that network. That gives you some idea of, of how information might flow through the profession. Um, it turns out to be fairly typical. If you look at mathematics, physics, you get uh, similar order numbers. Uh, Facebook, everybody always asks about this. Uh, um, average is actually 4.7. And that's, it, amazingly, on Facebook, 99.9% .9 of the nodes are connected in the largest component out of about 720 million pages as of 2011. Um, so it's a fairly small world in terms of the, the average path length, right? So from getting from one end of the network to the other, uh, you, you have less than five hops uh, in terms of getting that information across. OK. So one, one thing to understand then is, you know, just as a basic level, is why do you see such small average path lengths in such a large network? So Facebook isn't constructed to have short average path length. It's constructed for people to just communicate with their friends. You put 720 million people together, and you get a fairly small network in terms of overall diameter and, and average distance. And understanding this is fairly straightforward. Um, it, it has to do with the exponential reach that we have in, in moving outwards. So what you can do is begin, let's, let's do a simple calculation where what we'll do is just look at a tree, which is known as a Cayley tree, which is a very regular tree where at each point in time, everybody has exactly the same number of friends, and their friends always move outwards. So we don't have any loops coming back. Okay? So we start, you know, the first, friend, first person we look at has D friends. Then th each one of those people, they have the friend with the first, they reach another D minus one, and so forth. And we could just ask if this was the structure of the world, 
what would the average path length look like in that world? So just how, how far do we have to go out before we cover the whole world from this person's perspective? Right? So you just keep adding these up. As you go outwards, what do you end up with? Um, the next level is going to give you d. Uh, you've got another d minus 1 connections for each of these people and so forth. As you go outwards, you end up with a sum of how many nodes you've reached at each level moving out from this person. So looking at this person's network reaching outwards, if you go out L steps, then you've got this sum as how many nodes you've reached. For a reasonably large D, a good approximation for this is roughly D minus 1 to the L. Right? So this sum looks like this. If you just do the sum, partial sum, and then uh, take an approximation of it, it looks like D minus 1 to the L. So to reach everybody else in the society, if I want to reach n minus 1 other individuals, I just need d minus 1 to the L to be equal to n minus 1. I go through, and what do I end up with? L is on the order of log n minus 1 over log d minus 1, roughly log n over log d. Okay? So you get something which says, uh, expanding outwards for this very nice tree, it looks like the, the length we need is actually going to scale with the log of the number of nodes compared to the log of the reach in terms of number of fringes. Okay? So that gives us an idea that, that something which is, is going to be logarithmic in the number of nodes, that gives us an idea of why it could be very small. Now, obviously, this is a tree, and this, why, why on earth would, would something like Facebook look like a tree? It's not at all obvious, right? So if you take Facebook, it's not going to have a tree-like structure. It's going to have a much different structure. Um, well, what you can show is that there's a whole series of theorems that for many classes of large random graphs, Average distance and maximum distance are proportional to log n over the log of the expected degree. So it turns out, this is the, the first version of this is in the, why does it say Urgosh? Um, it's Erdosh, sorry. Um, so the, the first version of this appears in a famous paper by Erdosh and Renyi in the 1950s, late 50s and early 60s. They had several papers. Um, it, part of the reason that this happens is that even if you just put down links at random, you end up having a lot of a tree-like structure underlying the overall network. And you have enough of a tree-like structure and things expand rapidly enough that you still get the same kind of expansion property even if it's not constructed explicitly as a tree. And the proof of this kind of thing is, is now relatively well understood. There's a paper by Chung and Liu that extends it to a whole series of different degree distributions. I have a paper that extends it to economically relevant models that have characteristics in them. You can show that for a very rap, uh, wide class of models, you get the same kind of, uh, of structure. OK, so, so it looks like log n over log uh, expected degree. OK, um, let's just take a look and see whether this looks reasonable in terms of uh, empirical validity. This is taken from that same ad health data set that we looked at the romance relationships for. Um, these are 84 different high schools. This is actually taken from some work I did with, with Ben Golub. Um, here what we have is average shortest path length of the actual data, and then log n over log of the expected degree. And here you have a series of different high schools that varied in terms of their structure. Some were 50-person you know, high schools, some were 3,000. So you end up with very different sizes of the high schools, different stuff. And you know, basically, the log n over log d seems to fit the, the data, at least here, fairly well. In a lot of applications, it seems to fit fairly well. Okay. Um, just in terms of uh, you know, doing back of the envelope calculation, you know, people have heard of six degrees of separation. World, about 7 billion people. Suppose that each person has 50 reasonably close friends that they talk to. Log n over log d is, is roughly six. Right? So, so it's not hard to see why something on the scale of Facebook might end up with a fairly short average path length when you do these kinds of calculations. OK, so that, the first part here is we've got these networks. We have ways of measuring. One thing we were interested in measuring is average path length. Conclusion, a lot of these are going to have some sort of tr underlying tree-like structure, enough so that you can act actually have fairly short average path lengths in very large societies. OK, so that's one part of the picture, one thing that we might want to measure and keep track of when we're looking across different networks. Um, a second thing is then going to be neighborhood and degree, because it's not going to be that everybody has exactly 50 friends. Some people are very social, and some people might be very asocial. And capturing that is going to be 
be done by keeping track of who are the friends of person I in the network G. So who are the J's such that uh, I and J are connected in the network G. So I'll use this notation I, J, and G just to indicate that G, I, J is greater than zero, that they're connected in that network. Then a person's degree is just the number of connections they have. So degree is just a, a term for connectedness. And you know, an important aspect of a network is going to be how degree is distributed in a network. And so as we saw before, you know, by that picture of the core periphery network and the um, interbank loan network, we end up with very different possible degrees. We can have the networks that have roughly the same average degree having very different configurations in terms of who's connected to whom and how many people have very high degree and how many people have very low degree. So this is an area which is a, a sort of an important distinction in terms of networks. And one of the reasons that this is an important distinction is when we get to things like contagion or um, transmission, diffusion kinds of models, it's going to make a big difference whether we're in a, a network like this, where here if we, we hit this person with information, it instantly, instantly spreads to everybody else. Here, it might be much harder to get information to move from one part of the network to another. So having hubs and spokes networks look very different from having ones where everybody has more or less the same kind of degree. That can affect diffusion processes, contagion processes, information learning processes. So one thing we can ask is, you know, what does this distribution of degrees look like in a network? And we can just keep track of different ones. So if you look at two of the networks we've talked about already, um, here uh, I put the romance network has one degree distribution. So this is the degree on the x-axis and the frequency on the y-axis. Um, you get one distribution for, say, the, this romance network. You get a different distribution for the co-authorship network. And often you can look at different networks and you can order these things by means of stochastic dominance relationships. So one might be more dense uh, in, a, in the sense of a first order stochastic dominance, or it might be more dispersed in the sense of second order stochastic dominance. Doing these kinds of comparisons across degree distributions is actually something that then allows you to bring these to bear on information learning processes, other kinds of things that we want to figure out how, it, how it's working. Okay. So if you look at uh, fitting some of these things to, to data, um, this is a, a network. So here, what I did is put up some degree distributions of different networks and just show you that they, they exhibit different patterns. So empirically, you actually see some dramatic differences in the patterns. And let me just explain what these pictures look like. So often when people plot degree distributions in network science, the way that you standardly do this is on a log-log plot. So you plot the, the log of the frequency against the, the log of, of the degree. And so here, we've got log frequencies of, um, and the, the log of the uh, degrees. Uh, here, actually, it's the log of the complement of the CDF, which uh, actually behaves often similarly to the, to the frequency. And um, ones that are fairly curved are ones that look very much like a random network. So if you look at the high school romance network, if you put down a, basically a Poisson distribution, which is the distribution you would get if you randomly put down links um, with, a, with a, a given degree, you end up with a frequency distribution that matches the high school romance network very closely. If you look at something that looks like the World Wide Web, then these things are often said to have scale-free distributions, power law distributions, partly because this begins to look almost linear in, uh, in terms of its degree distribution. So what's happening here is you end up with many more nodes who have very high degree and very many more nodes that have very low degree than you get in some of the more curved distributions. You've got fatter tails and fewer nodes in the, in the middle. So this is looking at just the, um, a piece of the World Wide Web. This is from uh, Albert and Barabasi's work on this. And uh, you basically get a fit which is pretty good in terms of just looking at this as a, as a power law. Okay, so it looks like it has a Pareto distribution as opposed to something which is much um, more at random, uh, like a, a Poisson distribution. So the important takeaway here is that the distributions of these things have particular statistical patterns. They have, there's a diversity in these patterns, and th that diversity is quantifiable. And generally, there seems to be a fairly simple set of of different 
families of distributions that capture a lot of these. So there's ways of capturing the distributions in, in fairly simple and meaningful ways. OK. So what we've gone through is just sort of basic global patterns. I want to talk now a little bit about these segregation patterns, putting in node types and talking about homophily. And um, this is something which is obviously, you can actually find this in writings of Aristotle, Plato, and so forth. Um, you know, here's a quote from uh, uh, Philman Holland, birds of a feather flock together. Uh, so, so the idea that people associate with people who are similar to themselves is something that's well known, and it's been around for a long time. Um, I, I want to sort of point out from an economist's perspective, why on earth do we care about homophily? We care about it a lot because it affects the heterogeneity of behavior, beliefs, culture. It, it affects a lot of things. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be one of the main themes that we're going to come back to in terms of the identification when we get into the econometrics of some of this. And wh what's the issue here? The issue is that people tend to associate with, with people who have very similar characteristics to themselves. And that means that then when we are looking at peer influences, those peers are going to tend to be correlated in terms of their characteristics, both observed and unobserved characteristics. And the fact that they might be correlated in unobserved characteristics means that naturally their behaviors are going to be correlated. And that's going to make it very difficult for us to disentangle effects that transmit through the network and effects that were there just because of the people's characteristics, which tended to correlate with the network. And so actually endogenously figuring out what's really going on in terms of the network is going to be tricky. And that's going to be one of the main challenges in working with network data. Okay? And so that's going to be the main theme you'll see in lectures two and three of, of, of dealing with some of this. Um, it, it occurs across all kinds of different, you, pretty much any dimension of characteristic you can name, um, people have investigated homophily on and found fairly strong evidence for it. So it's, it's not surprising that you find it in age, race, gender, religion, profession, and so forth. Um, I, I can give you some pictures. This is one from a paper I wrote with uh, Sergio Corrini and Paulo Pin. These are students in a high school. They are color-coded by, by race, self-reported race in this case. Um, so this is an ad health data set again. Uh, these are the, the blue nodes are um, blacks. Red nodes, there's a few Hispanics in this school. Um, whites are uh, called ye yellow here. And then there's a few um, other, uh, depending on whether people click multiple characteristics or didn't report. Um, so there's some, some data uh, missing here. But basically, what this was drawn using, I, it wasn't as if I pushed all the, the yellow nodes to one part and pushed all the nodes, the blue nodes to another. This was drawn with what's known as a spring algorithm. So the algorithm for drawing this network, what it does is it tries to pull together nodes that are connected and push apart nodes that are not connected. And so it just iterates on that. And then after some number of iterations, you end up with a figure. Okay, and you can program. There's a whole series of algorithms from the network science literature that do this. But this is using one of the, the spring algorithms. And so it collected all these nodes together, even though they weren't drawn that way. So it pulls out the ones that tend to be connected. And you can begin to see community patterns in these things. And not surprisingly, uh, if you know something about uh, American high schools, um, the, the students are segregating fairly strongly ac according to race here. And if you look at the data, basically, the, there's 52% of the students are white here. You see 86% of the friendships um, of whites are with other whites. Black, 38% um, of the school, 85% of their friendships are with other blacks. Um, interestingly, Hispanics are 5%. They're actually very, once they hit, if you become a very small group, you tend to integrate well. So they're very well integrated. Actually, only 2% of their friendships are with other Hispanics, and, and they tend to integrate more than, than other groups. But you see these kinds of patterns where you see these segregations across groups. And that's going to mean, it's going to have several implications. One is that if we begin to think about, uh, say, adoption of certain kinds of opinions or technologies, it's quite possible that we'll see different equilibria, if you might, on one part of the network than on the other part of the network. So the segregation patterns can allow very different cultural norms to exist in different parts of the network and can allow things so that information might not spread from one part to another. So this is going to have profound consequences. And notice that this can be very independent of the other dimensions, like the average distance or the degree distribution. If we hadn't colored these nodes and pulled them apart in this manner, you might not see the particular segregation patterns that are there. And so adding these characteristics gives us another picture of what the network looks like. 
Um, one thing that happens here, what I did is, is actually uh, take the same network, but now what I did was color code this by what's known as strong friendships. So strong friendships here are ones where people actually could report different activities that they did with each other in a given week. And uh, code a, a network of friendship as being strong if people reported doing at least three different activities in a given week with another person. So studying together, going to lunch together, um, some athletic activity, and so forth. So they had a whole list of things they could click. Um, and now you see, actually, the network splits almost entirely. There's actually, I think, three friendships between blacks and whites once you code things by these stronger relationships. So depending on how you code things, you could end up with different segregation patterns. So here, it's a, it's a much more pronounced segregation pattern than it was before. Uh, this is from uh, a, a paper I, j I just wrote, and it's actually from data from a project I'll talk about a little later with Abhijit Banerjee, um, Arun Chandra Sikhar, and Estu Duflo. This is a village in India, and this is a, a, a kerosene and rice borrowing network. And in this case, the um, nodes are color-coded by caste. So the blue nodes are scheduled caste and scheduled tribes, so the, the castes that are recognized by the Indian government for affirmative action. The red nodes are the general and otherwise backward castes, so the um, more forward castes. And, and basically, again, you, you see a segregation pattern. This is also drawn by a spring algorithm. And now what you can, if you look at the number, the probability of a link existing between people in the same caste color, uh, designation in this case um, is about 9%, and it's about uh, 6 tenths of a percent going across. So you, know, you see more than 10 times probability of link between. And again, that's going to have consequences for a lot of transmission of information and so forth. This is an interesting one that comes out of uh, um, a paper by uh, Lucioni in, in 2013. I don't know if you ever saw this. This may, it was in the New York Times. Um, this is uh, US Senate co-votes. And what I'm going to do is just take you through three decades, uh, three different snapshots. So here, what have we got? We've got uh, senators and they're color-coded by political party, blue and, and red. And there's a link between two senators if they voted the same way on at least 100 bills in the, the given session of that particular year. Okay, so in 1990. So here, the network, you know, it, and this is, again, uh, pulled apart by a, um, a spring algorithm. So it collects the, the blue and the red tend to be on different sides, but it's fairly well meshed together. So this is 1990. This is 2000. So it starts to pull apart. There's fewer connections. 2010. So when people are talking about polarization, um, you can visualize it pretty clearly when you start using these algorithms and, and actually looking at the networks. So the, the co-voting together in, these, in the, you know, the Congress now is, is pretty much non-existent. So the, the votes are almost always um, who's that in the middle? So I can't quite read the, uh, yeah, who's, it's from Maine. Uh, who's the senator from Maine? Nelson, Nelson. yeah, yeah, it's Nelson. Um, so you, you get a few, and, and so obviously, you know, uh, Ron Burt has a, an important paper on, uh, one of the most important sociological papers on network structures. He talks about structural holes. So people that can be important in, a, in an organization are ones who are bridging different groups. Um, that looks like a structural hole. Uh, about as clearly as you can see them often in, in data. But, but you know, these kinds of pictures allow us to see and, and track whether or not we're seeing different patterns in homophily, whether they're changing over time. And one thing to sort of emphasize from this as well is often, just from data considerations, we tend to work with data in isolation, where we look at a particular snapshot and we treat this as the network, as if all these people were communicating and, and it was uh, static. But these things change over time. They're very fluid. Uh, people might communicate with some people intensely for some period, not for a long time, then intensely again. So the dynamics of networks is something which is sort of a nascent area of uh, methodological study and an important one for, for keeping in mind and pushing forward with. OK. So we've, we've talked through these two. Um, I'm going to leave local patterns uh, to talking. I'll come back to that in the, in the third lecture. But let me talk a little bit about positions in networks. And this will set up also a little bit of what Darun will talk about in, in the next thing. But trying to, to keep track of how important individuals are, how 
central they are, um, other kinds of things. So looking at the micro level now and looking at a particular node and trying to identify something about its characteristics. So economists, we care about networks because of externalities. And, and without externalities, networks would not be that interesting. So part of the reason they're really important is because somebody's behavior affects other people's behaviors, and they don't necessarily take that into account. But understanding how important somebody is and how influential they are is something that can be essential in a lot of different studies. So there's going to be a lot of heterogeneity in nodes influences, not just due to characteristics, but also due to, no to network position. So it could be that you know, a village has an elder, somebody who's wiser, and so forth. They might have a lot of influence just because of their position and their wisdom. But it could also be that somebody who's a shopkeeper tends to talk to a lot of people. And they can be very influential just because of their network position and not because of, of their knowledge or background. And so capturing things like centrality um, and influence measures and networks is, is going to be something that's important in a lot of applications. So how do we capture this? Well, it, it's going to depend on the nature of the, ap of the application and the interaction. And so what, what's happened is there's been a, a, a mushrooming of different measures of importance in networks. And there's all sorts. We, we, have no, we could spend more than four hours just going through different network influence measures. So today what I'll do is I'll just pull out a few of the most prominent ones and, and ones that are, are, are sort of well known and well used. And the most basic one is just what's known as degree centrality. Right? So this is just capturing how connected a node is. Uh, it, it's a basic measure. Um, you can normalize it if you want. So you know, keep track of what percentage of the people I'm connected to and so forth. Well, that's some measure of, of my reach or my influence. And if I know half the people in the room, then that's you know, a measure as opposed to knowing 1% of the people in the room. OK, so that, that's a very crude measure, and, and one that goes back to Simmel in, in around 1906. You know, he starts talking about importance of different individuals. Um, degree centrality is sort of a, a, a central, plays a, a central role. Um, if we go back to Paget's data, so for instance, looking at the Medici in this, so the, the Strozzi, the Gradani were other families that in, in this time period. There were a number of the other families who had better wealth and, and better political connections, and yet the Medici seemed to rise at this point in time. And if you, if you read the, a little bit into what Cosimo de' Medici was writing, he was engineering marriages of his family with other families with the idea of becoming important in, in the network. And in particular, um, you know, just in terms of degree centrality, we see that they, you know, they have six connections. The Strozzi have four, and the Guarani have four. So they look a little more important on this dimension. That doesn't really capture a lot of what's going on. We'll, we'll have other measures that might do better. But it, it, you know, it begins to capture something about the network. OK, what's a problem with degree centrality? A central problem, oh, I keep using the word central, sorry. Um, a problem with, the, with degree centrality is that it's not capturing several other things that you might want to capture. One is that people can be more influential, not just because they have more friends, but they, because they have better situated friends. And another is that, that somehow we want to capture where you sit in a network. So there's some idea that this, this node is more central in terms of where, it is, where it's placed, and also in terms of who it's connected to. And degree centrality labels these two nodes as being equivalently connected. So there's going to be large equivalence classes of nodes which really are very different animals in terms of what their connections are in the network and how, how potentially influential they are. So we want a measure that picks that up. OK, so the, the, cent the, the, the centrality measure which begins to do that is by thinking of saying the centrality should be proportional to the sum of your neighbor centralities. So let's just define the centrality of a node i to be proportional to the sum of the friends of i's centralities. OK, so we just want a, a, a measure which says it's not only the number of friends, but let's weight things by their centrality. And now we'll, we'll define things that way. OK, so very simple variation on this. Um, so what do we end up with? We end up with CI proportional to this sum of CJs. If we write that in terms of the uh, adjacency matrix, we have some scalar A times the CI is going to be equal to the sum of the GIJs times CJ. Right? So that's just in terms of our adjacency matrix. Well, this is, uh, this is just an eigenvector calculation. right? This is just saying that the vector of centralities is proportional to the adjacency matrix times the vector of centralities. So we've got uh, a system of equations and a system of unknowns, which looks exactly like a 
um, eigenvector calculation. So this is what's known as eigenvector centrality. And eigenvector centrality, uh, there's many different eigenvectors for an n by n matrix. Um, there can be up to n of them. In this case, what the tendency is to take the one which has all non-negative entries, which for a non-negative matrix by the perron frobenius theorem, there'll be a unique um, eigenvector which has all non-negative entries. And there's a, there's a lot of nice matrix algebra that'll tell us things about what this, this vector looks like. So we have an eigenvector calculation. We can go ahead and use that as a measure of centrality as well. Okay, so that's known as eigenvector centrality. Um, basically, Google PageRank, it should be a capital P, was, was named after this. So Google PageRank keeps track of, uh, it was, was early, in the early days, was the way that pages, if you clicked in a, a search and there were a whole series of things that might match, they had to rank which ones appeared first, second, and third. The original algorithm was actually based on an eigenvector calculation. It's become much more sophisticated since then, but that was the original, the or, origins of it, was um, using a, a basically an eigenvector calculation on the matrix that they kept track of. You can do random models, which, you know, if you look at a, a, a random Markov chain on a network, the percentage of time you'll spend at different nodes is going to be proportional to, this, to the eigenvectors. So this captures a whole series of things which are interrelated and have some nice mathematical foundations. So if we go back to that same network, we see you know, now this node comes out at 0.31, this one comes out at 0.11, so this one is much more central than the other one once we do this kind of calculation. And in fact, the most central node, this one has seven connections, this one only had uh, six, but it, it ends up being much more central in terms of eigenvector centrality. So you can go through and use this as a different measure of centrality, and it'll give you different information about positions in the network than degree centrality would. Right? And you can go back. The Medici are also the, the most eigenvector central family here. So Strozzi are, uh, I guess, a close second. Then Guadagni, Rodolfi, you do pretty well. So here, the Rodolfi do pretty well, even though they only have three connections. They're pretty well um, situated in this network. OK, another uh, prominent uh, measure is betweenness centrality. What is betweenness centrality measure? This keeps track of the number of shortest paths that a given node lies on. So one thing you could, say, you could do is say, am I essential for connecting other people in the network? So one way you could do that is say, look at all pairs of people. And if the shortest path between them goes through me, or one of the shortest paths goes through me, then I'm, a, I'm somehow important in connecting them. And so between the centrality then just does a calculation which says, OK, look, look at how many different connections there are, shortest paths between I and J. Then keep track of how many, what's the, the number of geodesics between I and J that K lies on. And then do a calculation which I get, if I'm on half of the shortest paths between person one and two, then give me a half for that. And then sum over all the possible pairs of other individuals. And then normalize by how many pairs you could be considering. And that gives you between the centrality. Okay. And so if you go back to this, the Medici are on 52% of the shortest paths between other families. And if you read into Cosimo's writings, actually, that was one of the things he was trying to engineer. They wanted to be important brokers in you know, the courts weren't so great at enforcing contracts and so forth at that time. You know, having, being an important broker between other people's business dealings was very uh, enriching. And you know, they, they lay on 52%, the Strozzi 10%, Gudani about 25%. So you begin to see differences here. And all of these measures are capturing different things, and they might be different applications that they're going to be useful in. OK. Um, so we've gone through degree centrality, sort of just keeping track of connectedness. These kinds of influence, prestige, eigenvector numbers, it's sort of not who you know, not what you know, but who you know kinds of calculations. That's going to be another important dimension um, which uh, captures things. So that's the eigenvectors between this importance as an intermediary. There's also another set of notions that we won't talk about today, but I'll just sort of throw out there, closeness kinds of measures. So you could just ask, you know, a given node, how close is it to other nodes? So some, I might be close to a lot of people, some other people might be more distant. So you can just keep track of, you know, what's my average distance to other people? So there's closeness and decay variations, um, uh, you know, ease of reaching out to, to other nodes. Okay, let's see. Um, I, I think what I'll do is, is this is probably a, a good place to sort of stop the first lecture.